Hey, my name is Sohan Maheshwar. I'm a dev advocate at AuthZ. And today I'm going to teach you how you can build authorization at scale with SpiceDB on Amazon EKS. In fact, why don't I just jump straight to my terminal and show you what we're going to build. So essentially, I already have a cluster on EKS that's running and it's running SpiceDB. And let's check for permissions that I've already written into that database. So essentially what I've done is uh, I'm checking if the user, uh, if the user Emilia has view permissions on this doc one, and you will see that it says true, right? So this is the end of what we're going to build today. But let me before that set some context about what we're actually talking about. And then I will show you a technical demo as well. So first things first, I think it's important to make the distinction between authentication and authorization. Now, this is a common sort of uh, misunderstanding that a lot of folks in the industry have. Uh, we personally prefer to think about it in terms of identity and permissions, whether you can verify someone's identity or authenticate them uh, versus what do they actually have access or what actions can they do or what permissions they have after they are authenticated. So for the purpose of today's talk, we are talking only about permissions. And I just showed you a permissions check as well. And that's what SpiceDB does. SpiceDB works with a bunch of different identity providers as well. And um, you can use your own too. And essentially then do permission checks. So to set some context, and I'm definitely going to date myself by showing this slide, but does anyone know what tech product I am showing here right now? If you are been in the industry as long as I have, I guess, uh, you might recognize this as Google Plus, or it was also, you know, colloquially called Google Circles, where they looked at social, well, they looked at a social network slightly differently, where you could group a bunch of connects and friends in what they call circles. So you would have a circle or a group for your college friends, for your family, for the people you play sports with, and you could select what you wanted to share with each of these groups. Now, as a social network, uh, it's been discontinued since, but two things actually came out of Google Plus that we still perhaps use in some way or the other even today. One, of course, is Google Photos. I use it. Uh, great product. The second is something called Google Zanzibar. Now, this is not a household name, and it probably shouldn't, but the fact is... Uh, Essentially, Google's internal uh, permission system is nicknamed Zanzibar, and they actually detailed all of it in a great paper written or released at least in 2019. So this is how the paper looks. You can check it out on zanzibar.tech, which is an annotated version of the paper. And the title itself, I think, is the key here. It says Zanzibar, Google's consistent global authorization system. For those of you all who have built distributed system before, you will know that achieving global scale and consistency at the same time, it's a hard problem to solve. It's, it's not a very trivial problem. So not only did was it solved in some way or form in Google, but this paper was actually written about something that existed and it wasn't theoretical. Right? So lots of great knowledge in the paper itself. In fact, just look at the cloud service that you use, you know, whether it's AWS, Azure, or GCP, uh, you will notice that IAM, or Identity and Access Management, is the only service that sort of spans all regions. It doesn't, it's not tied to a certain region uh, because these permission rules need to work across regions, right? And also fun fact, Google's IAM in Google Cloud uh, is a sort of fork of Zanzibar as well. Now. This paper was published in 2019. Uh, many big companies such as Airbnb and Carter, they use, they built rather internal uh, authorization systems based on this paper. Uh, it, it, the design can handle more than 10 million client queries per second. Um, and from a dev perspective, so for you and me, uh, it's an API, right? So you query this API and you get a response, which I just showed you. The cool thing that Google Zanzibar sort of uh, did differently uh, was the concept of reback or a relationship-based access control. Now, 
there are different ways of doing access control right now. The most common, I guess, is role-based access control, where you have certain roles like reader, writer, etc., and you tag like a user to a role. You also have attribute-based access controls where you have certain attributes and that gives you a little more fine-grained access, but it can, you know, um, uh, when it scales, it can get a little dicey. So how it did it differently was the concept of a relationship-based access control, which essentially describes relationship graphs, right? So between subjects and objects in your system. So say your system has users and documents and, um, you know, some other uh, format or some other object, you can draw relationships between these users, these objects, and so on. So to give you an example, and this is me totally manifesting that I speak at KubeCon, maybe person Sohan uh, has a relationship, is a speaker at conference KubeCon. And all speakers at conference KubeCon have access to the speaker dinner. Right. Again, totally manifesting. So essentially, when you draw a graph, you can draw or deduce the relationship that person Sohan has access to the speaker dinner, right? And in a very like rudimentary way, this is sort of how relationship-based access control works. Now, Google Zanzibar, the paper was written in 20 or released in 2019. And uh, about a year, year and a half later, uh, the founders of AuthZ essentially released in open source SpiceDB, uh, which was, you know, an implementation of the Google Zanzibar project. The, the key there was, of course, implementing it like the paper, but sort of removing the Googleisms, if you will, of the project to make it accessible by a developer that's not in Google. And um, because this was one of the first few implementations of Google Zanzibar, uh, as you can see, it has, you know, more than 5K stars on GitHub, a uh, very active community of developers, and, um, you know, it's completely open source, so feel free to contribute as well. So, well, what is SpiceDB and what is Zanzibar? Well, think of SpiceDB as Zanzibar Plus, you know. Um, with Zanzibar, you got these things. You had uh, Reback, uh, where each relationship between the objects and subjects in your system were described as edges in a graph. And these were defined in the terms of something called a schema, which I will show you. And because of that, it gave you flexibility to model what your internal system looks like uh, in that schema. The thing, the key tenet to both Zanzibar and SpiceDB is achieving scale. And this is not just scale in terms of, oh, we have 1 billion users, but scale in terms of um, worldwide geography and geographic scale, scale in terms of being able to launch features very quickly um, and have feature velocity and so on. It was built to support distributed data stores. And lastly, uh, Zanzibar also solved this thing called the new enemy problem with a concept of Zookies, which presumably, they don't mention it, but presumably stands for Zanzibar cookies. Uh, essentially, the new enemy problem is, say, you know, uh, Alice and Bob are, uh, they, ha they are on an access list to a folder. Alice removes Bob for that from that folder. And then Alice asks Charlie to move new documents to that folder. If you have not uh, maintained the hierarchy of or the ordering of what happened here, Bob should not be able to access that particular document in that folder. So that is the new enemy problem. And Zanzibar took care of that with the concept of Zookies. So SpiceDB was built with these principles in mind, but also added a bunch of different things like the developer experience and tooling around it so that anyone not just someone in Google, but anyone such as you and me can actually build authorization systems using SpiceDB and the existing tech stack that you have. Also added some things like um, the caveats where you can add a caveat for some piece of information that is context dependent for your authorization check. You know, like maybe you want to check is a user allowed to access this after 6 p.m. Right? and you can add that caveat in. So you're also adding some form of support for attribute-based control, uh, access control with caveats. Um, and also, very importantly, it added a reverse index API. So it wasn't just what does this user have access to, you could look at a resource and say who has access to this particular resource. So you're sort of doing a reverse index.
I did say I would speak about schema. So essentially, this is how a schema looks like. You know, you're defined a user in line one. I can show you there. You defined a document with a relation. Oh, sorry. With a relation, uh, a user can be a writer, a user can be a reader. And you can give permissions to those relations as well. So um, permission edit is equal to writer. So edit determines whether a user can edit a document or not. Whereas view determines whether a user can view this particular document. So in terms of view, both the reader and the writer can view, but only the writer can edit this particular document. Right? So you've taken this system that you have and you model that on a schema. So this would work uh, if you have a bank, if you have I know, a car sharing app, um, whatever. If you have a CMS, you can model all of that into a particular schema. And I mentioned this before, but SpiceDB is completely open source with active GitHub and Discord communities. There are contributors from companies such as Google, Reddit, Adobe, um, uh, GitHub, Red Hat, and so on. So if you're interested, uh, do join that community. There's also a good first issues bot if you want to jump in into a good first issue. So how does SpiceDB actually work? You know, I've, I've spoken about what it is, um, what it's based on. Essentially, I'm really simplifying it here for the purpose of this demo, but fundamentally, this is a gRPC service. If you're not familiar with gRPCs, you can, you know, a bunch of other videos that explain that out there, but a request in, G in SpiceDB basically goes through three phases, right? And let's break that down. So the first one is a request is received from a user. Say, hey, check whether permissions exist for this. And these gRPCs requests are sent over the protocol buffer or protobuf format. Again, that's an entirely different topic. But what you need to know is it's sent over protobuf, but SpiceDB is also capable of running a HTTP gateway that translates these requests into HTTP. Now, step two, once that request is received, it needs to be validated to you know, make sure that it is a valid request. Now, the validation is performed by protobuf in two steps. First one is any malformed requests uh, won't make it past the gRPC level, right? So gRPC has a processing layer and any request that doesn't conform to that particular format is dropped off. Second step is a, a semantic validation step where maybe it needs a certain level of, um, like a certain number of, um, uh, what's it called? Um, like a semantic validation, sorry about that, uh, where it needs like a certain ID or certain whatever data. And we essentially in SpiceDB use something called Proto C Gen Validate, which is a plugin to validate these requests that are coming in. And this is done in a, a middleware, a gRPC middleware called Validator. And the third form is called the Data Driven Semantic Validation Form. And this is done on specific requests as applied to the data that is stored in SpiceDB. Now, this validation is found sprinkled throughout. SpiceDB, uh, usually in the form of errors that are raised by individual pieces of code, right? So there are different ways you can validate this. After it's validated, you need to actually handle that particular request. And the gRPC API defines some top level methods. I'll talk about maybe a few of them and I'll show, show you a diagram which hopefully makes it clearer. The first one is simple CRUD operations against relationships. You can write a relationship, you know, uh, you can say, hey, this is a new relationship. Uh, you can read a relationship and you can delete relationships. All of this is stored in the data store. Straightforward. Then there are a couple of types of CRUD operations on the schema itself that I showed you. You can read schema and you can write schema. So if, you know, there's a new way to model something, a new object in your system, you can add that to your schema and write it to your schema, again, stored in the data store. The third one is the most exciting one and probably the reason SpiceDB actually exists, which is where you check for permissions itself. Um, there are three ones I'd like to talk to you about. The first one is check permission, where you check permissions. And you can also expand permissions, which expands the graph that I showed you earlier, which you can use to check for permissions and also to look up resources.
So all might seem a little confusing, so let me show you an architecture diagram. Hopefully it clears it up. Um, yeah, so th this is the OTZ API, like I said, gRPC, and you have all of these internal services. Now let's start towards the bottom. I said there are three relationship ones, write, read, and delete. And every time you write, read, or delete a relationship, it goes to the data store. This data store could be CockroachDB or Postgres, bunch of different options there in our docs. In today's example, we're going to be showing you how to do this in Postgres, which is the recommended approach for a single instance. If you want to write a schema or read a schema, again, straightforward API goes into the data store stored in Postgres. Now, these are the interesting ones where if you want to check permission, right, where you're determining if a given resource um, has permission to a direct member or a particular relation, it goes to an internal dispatcher. Now, dispatching is a core part of SpiceDB functionality, and this is where API requests are essentially broken down into smaller computations, and they are forwarded to or dispatched to other SpiceDB nodes within the cluster. Now, this is a design choice actually mentioned in Zanzibar to make your system uh, a lot faster. There's a lot of caching and uh, selective uh, dispatching that happens. Again, encourage you to read the Zanzibar paper to understand the nitty gritty details behind it. Once you look for check permission, that looks for the internal graph against the check, expand, or look up API calls that you're making, which again query the data store to give you the answer. So earlier when I wrote that uh, checkup, it actually went through to the check permission, went to my data store, got a response in no time and said that it was true. Okay, so that is essentially a very high level overview of what SpiceDB is uh, and how it sort of works under the hood. A lot more details you can find on our blog, but let's go on to the interesting part, which is you want to implement authorization in your system and you're on AWS. So how could you do this using Amazon EKS? So the prerequisites for this demo are pretty straightforward. I'm sure you have kubectl, kubectl, however you want to pronounce it on your system. Uh, you need an AWS account with the relevant permissions. And for this demo specifically, you need the Z CLI, but that's only for the last step. So if you have a system uh, that you want to in integrate with API calls, that's also fine. Let me show you a quick architecture diagram of how this looks. So you can have the Z CLI, like I showed you earlier, or your app via an API. Now this gets, um, this basically hits an, uh, like an API, right? And all of our AWS resources are within the same VPC or virtual private cloud. Uh, you need a route 53 hosted zone with a URL and that goes to a load balancer. Um, for this demo, I'm using a classic load balancer, but if you're doing this in production, you might want to use a network load balancer because that behaves slightly better with gRPC calls. And that essentially hits my Amazon EKS cluster. In my cluster for this demo, I have two nodes, but again, you can choose to have a bunch of different nodes. And each of my nodes have different pods that are running. Um, I've chosen to run my um, nodes in EKS on EC2. You can perhaps run it on Fargate as well, but again, I've shown this demo on EC2. And we have SpiceDB that's actually running within uh, each of these nodes. Uh, those permission checks are stored in a data store, which is in Amazon RDS uh, using Postgres SQL. So that's essentially how it works. And um, this guide is on authset.com slash docs and just look for EKS. We're going to go step by step into how this works. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to open up my terminal and take you through the steps. Now the first step actually is to um, create a cluster on EKS, All right? Let me just find, yeah, there we go. This is a cluster I've created. Uh, honestly, you can just create a new cluster and pretty much choose the defaults here. Uh, let me just open this, yeah. All of this works. Um, make sure you get the right uh, role permissions and things. Um, 
config map is being deprecated by AWS soon. So you can either choose to use EKS API or EKS API and config map if you already have a cluster that's on config map. Um, and yeah, uh, you'll, you'll see an option for um, networking. Again, make sure you're in the same VPC and same subnet. Right, I'm just going to go back. Um, and when you see the option to choose either EC2 or Fargate, I've chosen EC2 for this demo. Um, once you've done that, make sure that your kubectl is configured to use that EKS cluster. Um, for instance, this is the name of my cluster. And if I do K, um, I think it's called config current context. It is showing me the ARN of that particular cluster, right? So kubectl is configured to use the cluster that I've created. Uh, if you're not sure how to do this, there's enough documentation on AWS to actually do that. The second thing you want to do is now dynamically configure, uh, to dynamically configure DNS is to grant access in your IAM. So you create uh, a policy and attach it to the role that's used for the pods in EKS. So you need three permissions. I have already opened it in my IAM policy here. You need to be able to change uh, Route 53, change resource record sets in Route 53, and also list hosted zones by name in Route 53. So create this policy, attach it to the role that you're using for your EKS pods. Now EKS is Elastic Kubernetes Service, so you might I figured we're using Kubernetes, <laughs> um, and for Kubernetes, we recommending that uh, we recommend that you install Cert Manager, right? Because we have to do this, um, we have to verify our certs. So, Cert Manager is an open source project, so you can actually just you know do something like this, where yeah, you just use apply f, and um, you know you do Cert Manager .yaml, and this applies that cert manager to your current config. All right, uh, there are different ways you can install cert manager into um, your context as well. Uh, you can look at the documentation for that. Basically check this. You will see if this is running, you will see that you have installed, um, all your pods are basically healthy, right? And you can actually see that it is healthy. Cool. So. We want to create a namespace to deploy SpiceDB2, right? And um, for this guide, I'm just going to call it SpiceDB. So I'll do something like this where I do a kubectl apply and I'll just create a kind of namespace with some metadata, uh, fairly straightforward. And from there, I'm going to create uh, an Acme flow with let's in encrypt for our certificates, right? Essentially, we're using cert manager to use a DNS challenge. This is what my YAML file will sort of look like. Let's bring this here. Ooh. My VS code is right here. Yeah, okay. And as you can see, you can put like your own email ID here. Uh, now here's the key. <clears throat> so you, you have to open up root 53 and choose your DNS zones here. Uh, I'm just going to open up my root 53 here, there we go. And you can see some test hosted zones here. All right, yeah, okay. Here we go, autset.show. So these are the hosted zone details. And this is the DNS entry that I want to add for my selector. Um, make sure your region is selected and your hosted zone ID, which you can also find in the same page, is pasted into this so that, you know, it, it verifies that particular ID. And again, if you have, um, you know, say, eks.odz.show, make sure this is specified here. And also make sure this is the URL we are going to deploy to in a later step, right? That That is a gotcha that you might, uh, that I've seen, you know, people not do. So this is the URL we will be deploying it to later or, yeah. All right, uh, again, just to make sure that um, the resources are created 
you in your cert manager we want to check the namespace and do get secrets and you will see here that there is a config you want to make sure that this tls file is actually there right uh, if it's not present again troubleshooting don't go to the next step all right so now that's done you want to configure the dispatch that I have told you about. Essentially, Spice DB dispatches work across instances in the same deployment via gRPC. I, I told you about that. So we'll create a YAML file, call it internal dispatch.yaml. And let's maybe add that in. This is the YAML file. Um, for this, feel free to choose anything. I've just kept it as dev.spicedb. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You're essentially creating a dispatch certificate in this namespace. And yeah, that's it. And you, you just want to do a kubectl apply to this YAML file. So this is called internal dispatch. And I will do something like this. And this will apply it to my cluster. Cool. So. We have sort of set all of that up. Now we actually want to deploy our Postgres RDS data store. Now this is where all the schema and the relationships and all of the data is essentially stored. So I go to RDS, uh, there we go. And I've created this already. Again, feel free to choose the options you want or you can just go with the basics. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes, which is why I did the demo beforehand. And yeah, make sure it's in the same VPC and subnets as you know, as your EKS and your EC2 instances. But this is where things will be stored. Um, in configuration, make sure you get the endpoint, which you see here, as well as the username and password. Sometimes this password is automatically chosen by Postgres if you choose that option. So make sure you write it down or paste it into your AWS secrets or wherever, because we need this later on. All right, so once that's done, you want to initialize and configure and um, the operator, the Spice DB operator in Kubernetes itself. So um, if you go to the Spice DB operator. There are instructions on how you can actually install a release of this. It's again, pretty straightforward. There's a YAML file and you just do a kubectl and apply the YAML. Ooh. This is sort of how this looks like to configure the Spice DB settings. I'm just going to do this here. Yeah. Um, you can see that you can specify the number of replicas you essentially want. Two is fine for this demo. And this actually is the type of data store. In this case, it is Postgres. There are a couple of things you need to change. One is the pre-shared key. This key could be anything, so you can choose to just keep it a very secret pre-shared key, but remember that. And this is the URL that I was telling you about, where you have to reply, replace user with that username, with the password, with that endpoint URL followed by 5432, which is the port Postgres uses. And once you've done, save this in a config YAML, and then just do uh, apply like this, and it will apply these details to your cluster and get your data store up and running. I'm just gonna go back to our architecture diagram here. So we have deployed this RDS, we have deployed all this EKS thingies, and we've deployed this Route 53 zone. We basically need like a load balancer, right? Um, in production, you want a load balancer. So that's the last step we are going to take. So how we do that is with another YAML file. We just seem to love YAML here, but hey, this is the world of containers and Kubernetes. So this is how we would have, I'd create like a spice db hyphen load balancer dot yaml. And yeah, uh, this is essentially creating a classic load balancer. If you're in prod and you're using gRPC, I'd recommend creating a network load balancer because those work better and you know, I yeah. And you specify the ports, the protocol, gateway, etc. This 
you just make sure you specify the same name that you gave earlier when you were configuring the spice db settings in the previous step so if there if you've called it dev hyphen spice db make sure you call it the same thing again do a cube ctl apply on this on the spice db dot yaml you can actually check if this is working with seeing what services are running in your namespace so i'm just doing a cube ctl get services and let me specify the namespace as well find send spice db and i actually see the url of my load balancer that's been created you know this is just um, it's just parsing and getting the first uh, using json the first index in the array but if you just do a get services within this namespace you will see this in the entire json as well so if you have that url that's fine make sure you take this output and add it as a cname record in your route 53 hosted zone so let me go to my route 53 hosted zone yep that's here uh, i can create a new record and add the subdomain remember this is a subdomain in the earlier step that we've already done the cert manager and verify right very very important because if you add a new subdomain here it's not verified for the encryption and tls so in that subdomain you can add the value of your uh, load balancer and you should be good to go all right let's see if you have anything else to do no that that's pretty much it so yeah those were the steps to get it up and running now spice db has a rather yeah actually spice db has this thing called z which is a cli client um you can see all of the flags and the available commands here you can install it using brew or from source or whatever this is one way to test out your app but you can also just call the api from within your app so in z you can set context so I'll say context set. You can give it any name like uh, EKS guide, whatever, followed by the, again, the subdomain, right? So in my case, it would be EKS.outset.show followed by a very secret key. Make sure again, it's the same key that we added in that Postgres step. And again, I've done this already, so I can just do context list and you can see there are two contexts. So I'm just going to and it's set as EKS guide. So now I can now I can choose to write a schema into this. I can choose to create relationships and I can use choose to check permissions as well. All right. So let's create a schema in this case. So I'm creating a schema. I'm writing a schema. So this is using the schema, right? I'm defining a user and I'm defining a document where relation user can is owner and permission owner can view right so i've again done that already and i can write a let's write a new relationship right we will say user sohan yeah so you will get a warning if it's an old version but you will get some sort of key there to tell you that it has been written so let's do a permission check so i will do z permission check doc one user so on oh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i forgot to say what i'm checking for there we go yeah and it says true uh, let me try a different name i will say bob right false because right now only user sohan and from earlier user emilia have access so that essentially was how it worked let me just go back to my demo now you might think okay all of this is well and good um you know sure but you have been implementing like your own version of authorization at work it's, it's working fine so why is this important here's why it's so important so i know if you have heard of owasp or owasp it stands for open worldwide application security project now this is like an industry body which looks at things like security within um, the industry every year for the last few years they've been coming out with a list 
of um, biggest security risks to web apps. Do you have any guesses as to what was number one this past year or in 2024? If you guessed broken access control, then well, that is actually spot on. Um, for the last few years, actually, broken access control has been number one on the biggest or most critical security risk to web apps. Strangely, in 2017, it was number five on the list where there were other things that were above the list, but those things have been fixed and they've been standardized in an industry. So right now, I think we're at a stage where we should be doing uh, authorization or we should be letting others do authorization authorization and not do it ourselves because the most common industry pattern is to embed authorization code in an application already and this is not something we recommend doing or shouldn't be done uh, like an old monolithic application here makes a database call and says if this is an allowed user return true and just do something and this has many drawbacks one is, of course, it, it is not safe, but uh, in terms of when you have traffic that scales past the limit of your solution, your performance is impacted. At the same time, if a customer requests for a new tricky feature, this complexity of what you're doing actually increases, again, potentially providing a security risk or at the very least, just blocking development and feature velocity in your company. And lastly, if your business is moving to a new geography, your data isn't distributed when you do something like this. And in a way you start excluding a market with uh, very, very uh, you know, high latency and uh, lots of load times and potentially you're losing revenue. So take it from OWASP that uh, the most critical security risk now is broken access control, which is why you should probably be letting someone else do the authorization for you. Um, app permissions are hard. It's not a trivial problem, but we all have to do it. And we are all talking at global scale now. So now is the time to actually look at it. I've come to the end of my presentation, but for next steps, you want to play around with schema. It's fun just playing around with how to model your system. You can do it on play.odz.com slash schema. If you want to read a deep dive on how SpiceDB's architecture works, you know, for the geekier folks or people interested in distributed systems, check out that blog post. And also feel free to contribute to SpiceDB. It is completely open source. We have a GitHub and a Discord um, uh, discord server which is super active so you know jump in on there and um, yeah i hope to see you there please feel free to connect with me on linkedin if you have any questions or enjoyed this webinar until next time uh, have a good day and see you soon